You're listening to As Read By Me, the podcast where writers read and readers listen. Greetings and welcome to As Read By Me, episode 204. I'm Dave Stiles, and I'll be your guide on today's expedition. On our first stop, Peter Waits shares some insight from his ongoing analysis of the many differences between men and women in his story entitled My Wine Day. Then, Paul Camerata delivers his Ode to Elbows with a poem entitled Get Bent. And finally, Mike Archer takes us out into nature for some animal eavesdropping in an excerpt from his book entitled Living with Humans. Ready, gang? Let's go. Stay with the group. My name is Peter Waits. This is my story, My Wine Day, as read by me. Oh, by the way, wine is W-H-I-N-E, not W-I-N-E. I don't drink wine, except for the four glasses of Manischewitz I drink at our Seder on Passover. But every once in a while, I need to wine. And today is my wine day. And it is good to wine. The experts have weighed in. Couples that don't argue with each other are in big trouble. They quietly hold grudges. And that is the death knell for a relationship. Couples that want their relationship to last forever and ever have to learn how to argue properly, how to express their gripes in a productive way, hence my wine. As one young woman recently told me, this is what she mentioned to her counselor, he won't argue with me, and I wish he'd say something. Damn it, I wish he'd fight with me. If that couple comes here to our house, you know who and I are here to help them. Because we have been doing it for so long, we have mastered arguing. And we are prepared to let them and you, if you need it, come here to watch us argue so you two can learn the right method, so you can have a long-lasting, loud-loving, and passionate relationship. In the 1950s, Arthur Godfrey had popular morning and evening shows on both radio and television. On his programs, he often used to strum his ukulele and sing insensitive songs. One was so insensitive I can't bring myself to repeating it here. The other one has a slight edge, but it isn't too bad, and here it is. You keep me waiting till it's getting aggravating, you're a slow poke. Over the years, it would have been apropos for me to buy a ukulele to sing this song. Being tidy annoys me. For example, in our relationship, the one between you know who and me, I am the one that likes to be on time. You know who was less concerned and her tardiness impacts how long it takes us to get ready to go out. Typically, from my perspective, and if our getting ready to go out was being broadcast on the radio, this is how it would sound. The announcer would begin, It's time to start to prepare to leave the house. Both contestants have showered and are at the starting line. Ready? On your mark. Get set. Go. First, a little background. My closet is not in our bedroom. My clothes were expelled decades ago because there was no room for her clothes and mine in what would normally be considered our shared bedroom closet. My small wardrobe was banished to hang with stuff cluttering the floor. The I have no idea what the stuff is in the closet in the guest room. Now that the background is out of the way, it is time to get back to the story. The man of the house, that's me, has two bureaus in his room. He has walked over to the bureau near the window and has opened the third drawer down and has extracted underwear and a T-shirt. He next opened the fourth drawer down and extracted a pair of socks. He then donned these items, and so partially attired, he went to his closet, extracted a shirt and a pair of trousers, and he donned them. Then he reached for his belt and wove it through the loops and buckled it. All of this took approximately three and one-half minutes. Fully attired, he is now ready to descend to the first floor, put on his shoes, put on a jacket, and depart. But he can't depart just yet, because his other half has not descended from upstairs yet. The woman of the house, that's you-know-who, began to get ready for her departure at the same time as the man of the house. But for her to get all for putzed, all dressed up, is a time-consuming endeavor. When he was already descending to downstairs, she was still standing nude in front of her closet, and she was quietly talking to herself. If we got close to her, we would hear her musing about what she would like to wear. Her decision is difficult. 
Her selection is large. Her closet is jammed full. And then, after picking up this or that, she still has to decide which shoes or boots best complement her selection. The footwear selection is not easy. With about 50 pairs to choose from, a lot of color matchups are taking place. The time she stands in front of her closet of her getting ready to get dressed varies, but I can say with confidence that it will go on and on and on for quite some time, well past the three and a half minutes of her husband. Eventually, she does come downstairs, but our departure is still not imminent if she is carrying a necklace. As we have aged, it has become more and more difficult to properly secure the tiny and very frilly clasp of her necklace. It is now my job to attach it. And even though my eyeglass prescription is current, attaching the delicate clasp is becoming more and more difficult. Yeah, it does get done, and momentarily I then assume we are about to go, but my thought is premature. At the moment I am experiencing a premature evacuation. Walking through the door, she will suddenly stop, and she will turn around. She needs multiple tries to exit the house. The pattern is well established. She walks across the room. I open the front door, and then she turns around and she walks back into the house. Why? I don't know. I have no idea. She just likes to wander around. In summation, when it is time to go, I'm fast, she's slow, and we need to compromise. We each need to give a little, and that means for me to slow down a bit and for her to speed up a bit. For us to meet halfway, we will both just have to learn how to be half fast. Hi, I'm Paul Camerata, and this is Get Bent, as read by me. What a year it's been for elbows, such an age to be alive, when we germ-free mid-arm hinges like no other time have thrived. While our hearts go out to handshakes, palms and fingers, what a run. There's a new joy in the world. It's we elbows having fun. Sure, in the past we did get bent at other extremity fuss. While we were tucked away in sleeves, no one would humor us. But humorous heaven it's been of late, leading goodbyes and greetings. Everywhere you go an elbow is, central to people's meetings. It's the joint I think you would agree, keeping the world spinning. Like never before, no one can slow the elbows from their winning. Nope, no Tommy John, no macho man, no arm-patched coat or sweater. Has ever had an elbow that has ever had it better. Hi, this is Mike Archer. I have a short story collection called Living with Humans, Stories of Each Other. This is the main story of the collection, Living with Humans, as read by me. It was a high blue sky with cotton ball clouds and a gentle breeze. Regal was swooping and gliding high above the treetops. The month of May brought the glories of spring, and for Regal and Queenie, a new life getting ready to hatch in their giant nest on top of the tallest tree in Willow Lake Park. The bald eagle couple had lived together in the park for several years. It was owned by the town of Madison, about 15 miles north of Philadelphia. Regal could look down on the walking trails, the lake stocked with fish that he often caught for dinner, a rolling meadow, the lush forest, wildflowers, a bird-watching shelter, and a pavilion for picnics. People could lose themselves walking through the dense woods, where the only sound was the music of the birds and the buzz of the bugs. Regal started his 80-mile-an-hour dive over the edge of the lake. He swooped down in a J-shaped curve toward the middle of the lake, His talons broke the still water as he grabbed a small fish and rose to the sky on his way back to Queenie. Shadow the squirrel was nervously hopping around the floor of the woods, also looking for something to eat. While he preferred fruit, nuts, and vegetables, he would also enjoy a bug or a juicy caterpillar. He was about five feet off the walking trail when he heard two middle-aged women approaching. He was not afraid of being seen. Humans just accept squirrels as part of the landscape and ignore them unless they get into their attic. The women were talking nonstop. 
Shadow just considered it white noise. Not this time. Well, the Board of Supervisors said the town was in such a deep financial hole that it had no choice but to sell the park to that developer who's been building homes all around the area. They say the money from the sale and taxes from the new homeowners will solve all the financial problems for years to come. The other woman shook her head. I know a lot of people are upset and want to know how we got into this mess. I walked through this park with my mother when I was a little girl. We don't need more houses and traffic and noise. Her friend said, well, I hear the deal is done and there's no turning back. Shadow jolted up on his hind legs and dropped the bug he was about to enjoy. His world had suddenly changed. He had heard horror stories from his friends about their homes being wiped out by developers. But he thought Willow Lake had been here for generations. It would never be destroyed for money. Shadow's next thought, go tell Regal. Regal had just settled down in the nest. Queenie was sitting on the egg. One of them would always be with the egg. Regal would pull his duty of egg-sitting and love the idea of being a father. They started sharing the catch of the day. The nest was at the top of the tallest tree in the park and was six feet long and three feet wide. Regal and Queenie met in the park a couple of years earlier and had become partners for life. They were the proud symbol of America from its founding. By the mid-20th century, man had almost wiped out the species. Hundreds of thousands of bald eagles were killed by hunters and pesticides. Their habitat was nearly destroyed by pollution from oil, lead, mercury, and power line electrocution. Queenie was enjoying dinner. You were back quickly today. Any news from your flight? I was just enjoying the beautiful day and thinking how lucky we are, but I am concerned about the world our new baby will find when he or she grows up. Queenie knew this was something constantly on their minds. They had friends who had moved miles away after developers' bulldozers ripped up their world. Shadow was mumbling to himself as he climbed up Regal and Queenie's tree. Why did they have to live this far up? I even get dizzy up here. The bird traffic is crazy. As he came up to the bottom of the nest, he called out, Regal, Queenie, hello, it's Shadow, I'm coming up. Regal and Queenie knew Shadow had something important to talk about. They knew he did not like the long climb. Shadow climbed over the edge of the nest and sat on the outer edge not to disturb Queenie and the egg. Shadow was a little out of breath. Regal, I have some bad news. I just heard two women talking. They were saying the Board of Supervisors was selling the park to developers because they were in financial trouble. They said it's a done deal. Queenie looked quickly from Shadow to Regal. He was staring at Shadow. She could see the rage in his eyes. He turned his head to look out at the horizon. As the breeze ruffled his feathers, he said, This is the day we all feared. Shadow already knew this was a life-changing development, but Regal's reaction made him shudder. Regal was the one they all recognized as their leader. He was not only the symbol of the country, but his species survived the worst instincts of man's greed and indifference. Shadow knew the news would shake the park with the force of a hurricane. What do you need me to do, Regal? Regal turned toward Shadow without hesitation and said, Go tell Big Buck and have him set up a meeting of the council. Shadow climbed down under the nest and started the long trip back to the forest floor. Queenie looked at Regal. When will this ever end? For hundreds of years, generations of our ancestors have been slaughtered. It's a miracle we're here today. Now we need to worry whether this baby we're about to hatch will have to live in fear and find fewer and fewer places to live. Humans will never change. We can never trust them. Regal knew the history all too well. It finally took drastic measures by humans to stop the hunters and the pesticide makers from almost wiping out the species entirely. Man's relentless push for new development was a constant threat. Regal said, We will do everything we can to protect our new baby and the rest of our friends in the park. They've all been through this before. We just have to make sure everyone can survive. Shadow knew where to find Big Buck. He stayed in the thickest part of the woods during the day. He liked to roam at night when the park was quiet. Buck was grazing among the trees when he heard Shadow approaching. He raised his head crowned with six-point antlers. Shadow knew Buck was a no-nonsense guy and wasn't much for small talk. He turned from the grass he was munching and gave the nervous squirrel a look that said he really didn't want to be disturbed. Shadow, what's up? To what do I owe the pleasure of you interrupting my lunch? 
Shadow sat up on his hind legs and swallowed hard. Regal sent me down to tell you to call a council meeting because the park is being sold to developers. They're going to build houses. Buck raised his voice. What? How do you know this? Regal was getting more nervous. I heard two women talking. The town has real money trouble. One woman said it's a done deal. Damn it. How many times do we have to go through this? They never have enough. It's always more houses and streets, more cement, more blacktop, and more power lines. This can't wait. We will meet tonight in the usual spot. I need you to let the council members know. You can move around more freely than I can. Can you handle that? Shadow felt he was being trusted with a great responsibility. I got it, Buck. I'll make sure everyone is there. Buck said, I'm counting on you. Welp, that's the end. But that's not the end. And if you want to find out what happens to Queenie, Regal, Shadow, and all the animals in Willow Creek Park, you can find the conclusion of the story in Mike Archer's book, Living with Humans. It's available on Amazon, and I've included the link to the book in the episode description. And you can find text versions of all of today's stories, as well as more information about our writers, at asreadbyme.com. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app. And if you'd like to help us out with a donation, we would surely appreciate it. You can do so by going to asreadbyme.com and clicking on the donate button. Thanks for listening. <laughs>